Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and welcome here to Chapter 9. This is Photosynthesis, Capturing Light Energy. So keeping this in mind, the capturing of light energy for the process of photosynthesis, let's look at all living things that surround you. Where you're listening to this right now, I do not know. Hopefully you're somewhere close to, I guess I'll say, the outdoors. And if you are, I hope there are trees around you. And even maybe your pet dog or maybe a pet fish or whatever your pet may be. Even a cat or a snake. Let me hush. But of course, this includes your very own body. All of those living things. So what I'll get to is that most of that biomass is made up of carbon-based biological molecules. What is the ultimate source of all of that carbon? Well, what may be surprising to some is that that source of carbon is carbon dioxide. And of course, it comes from the air. So using that source, our cells cannot take carbon dioxide from the air and incorporate it into organic molecules. We cannot. However, some plant cells can. They do so through the process known as photosynthesis, that sequence of events in which the orderly systems in these cells provide the information needed to convert light energy into the stored chemical energy of organic molecules. So it's with this that photosynthesis is the first step in the flow of energy through most of the living world, capturing the vast majority of the energy that living organisms use. So photosynthesis not only sustains plants, such as you will see in your textbook on page 187, and other photosynthetic organisms, such as algae and photosynthetic prokaryotes, but also indirectly supports most non-photosynthetic organisms, such as animals, fungi, protozoa, and most prokaryotes. So keeping all of this in mind, it's that photosynthetic organisms convert carbon dioxide into billions of tons of organic molecules per year. These molecules have two important roles in both photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic organisms. They are the building blocks of cells, as of course you saw by way of our last chapter being on respiration, as well as a source of chemical energy that fuels those metabolic reactions that sustain almost all life. So photosynthesis also releases oxygen, which is essential to aerobic respiration the process by which plants, animals, and most other organisms convert this chemical energy to ATP to power cellular processes. So here, you all will examine how light energy is used in the synthesis of ATP and other molecules that temporarily hold chemical energy but are unstable and cannot be stockpiled in the cell. We'll also get to how that energy power is the anabolic pathway by which a photosynthetic cell synthesizes stable organic molecules from the simple inorganic compounds CO2 and water. And we'll finally explore the role of photosynthesis in plants and in Earth's environment. So let us begin here now with the first section of chapter 9 being 9.1, light and photosynthesis. Because most life on this planet depends on light, either directly or indirectly, it is important to understand the nature of light and its essential role in photosynthesis. Visible light represents a very small portion of a vast continuous range of radiation. I'm calling that the electromagnetic spectrum class, EM. So all radiation in this spectrum travels in waves, and a wavelength is that distance from one peak of that wave to the next. So with this in mind, 
I'll just mention briefly that gamma rays have very short wavelengths measured in fractions of nanometers, and they're of course quite dangerous. And then radio waves have very long wavelengths, and they're measured in kilometers or kil kilometers. So with these things in mind, yes, those waves differ greatly in, of course, wave length, and of course, the available energy of those waves. So if you look closely, yeah, we have the electromagnetic spectrum here given on the left, in that it shows you TV and radio waves, and of course, gamma rays, which I mentioned class as they are measured. Well, what's more important, class, is right here in the center, visible light. So this is that color spectrum of visible light. And given this, just keep in mind where A, I guess I'll say longer wavelength light is located, and B, where shorter wavelength light is located. So given this, just keep in mind, and I'll just get right to it. Shorter wavelength light has more energy, has more energy than longer wavelength light. And I'll get to the term called the photon here shortly. But just keep in mind where this is here. And where that is there for the process we're getting to called photosynthesis class. So I almost mentioned the word photon, but I didn't want to get the photons until I got to it in the lecture. So light is composed of small particles or packets of energy called photons. So it's that energy of a photon that is inversely proportional to its wavelength, i.e., shorter wavelength, shorter wavelength light has more energy per photon than longer wavelength light. So when a molecule absorbs a photon of light, one of its electrons becomes energized, and one of two things happen either. A, the atom may return to its lower energy ground state, and the energy will dissipate as heat, or it will fluoresce. Or secondly, the energized electron may leave the atom and be accepted by an electron acceptor molecule. Hello, getting to reduction and oxidation class. So keeping those things in mind, this is the way in which everything is about to work by way of that chloroplast for photosynthesis. So you're seeing what I mentioned moments ago. Here is one, as it was mentioned, and here is two, as it was mentioned, meaning the electron may return to that ground level by emitting less, fo less energetic photon, and of course, we have heat being given off. Or, of course, the electron may be accepted by an electron acceptor molecule, such as we're seeing there. Quite amazing how this works, class, with, of course, these photons and the electrons. Now on to chloroplasts. So within the chloroplast is the pigment known as chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is that green pigment found in the chloroplasts of plants and is in the mesophyll. For instance, I say again, within the mesophyll, we find the green pigment chlorophyll by way of the chloroplasts, if that can help you. And I'll show a picture of your class shortly. Structurally class, this is called the stomata. Singular putting them would be stoma. And that that is not singular being plural is stomata. So stomata class are made up of two guard cells. And I'll show you the photo of this here shortly. So let's just say that's a guard cell and that's a guard cell. And of course you have that that surrounds it on either side. And this is a horrible depiction. But of course, that looks like a face now. That allows the exchange of gas. So if I were to continue drawing this portion here, and this being that lower epidermis of the leaf, arrow going in class, meaning CO2 would be entering the leaf, and it would be definitely class oxygen gas exiting the leaf, O2. And it's all by way of the stomata. They're their class for the exchange of gas by way of diffusion.
Here's the figure I'll mention that show. So what we have, class, is a cross-section of leaf. So I guess I'll put here leaf, and I'll just write C, S, for leaf cross-section. So with this, you have that upper epidermis class, which is made up of a single layer of cells. It's transparent. If you want to ask why, the question being asked is answered by saying, class, that that single layer of epidermal cells, which is transparent, is transparent, class, to allow the process of photosynthesis to occur, meaning light has to penetrate down into these photosynthetic tissues. So we have, class, the mesophyll. So the mesophyll class, of course, contains those chloroplasts, by way of the chlorophyll, which, of course, is why these leaves appear to be green. So I haven't gotten into it too much at all, but I'll say, class, that is why leaves are green, because, of course, they're reflected in light. I say again, they're reflected wavelengths. Nextly, there is the spongy mesophyll, which is deep to the palisite mesophyll. And then, of course, there is a vein with both the xylem and phloem, which are the two types of vascular tissues, as xylem and phloem. And lastly, but not least, we have class a stoma there and a stoma there, allowing class gas to be exchanged. So, of course, oxygen exits the leaf and CO2 enters into the leaf for the process. So, the chloroplasts, by, by way of structure, chloroplasts are like the mitochondrion, and of course, they are enclosed by both outer and inner membranes. So, the inner membrane encloses that fluid filled stroma, not stoma or stomata, but I said stroma. So, within the stroma class are enzymes. And those enzymes are their class to produce the carbohydrates we'll get into here shortly. So suspended in the membranes are interconnected sets of flat disc-like sacs. And these flat disc-like sacs are known as thylakoids. So of course, when you get stacks of such, it's like a short stack of pancakes, and they call those class grana. And if it were to be singular class, it would be known as a granum. And I'm just correcting my handwriting. It would be a granum. And that is singular. So to, to make sure I do a bit of review, just keep in mind that chlorophyll is found in the thylakoid membrane which also contains several other pigments, which I'll get to class here shortly. So this shows you what a chloroplast looks like. So yes, we have both class the outer and inner membrane. And then within which, meaning within the inner membrane, is that stroma, that watery substance, the watery, the watery substance or the watery portion that contains the enzymes class for of course, the synthesis of carbohydrates. So, next thing that's next class is the intermembrane space, which you can now see. The intermembrane space, of course, that's the space between both the outer and inner membranes. The thylakoid membrane is their class, and then within the thylakoid membrane is the lumen of the thylakoid. And of course, you see a stack, and if there is a stack class, most definitely that stack is referred to as being a granum. And now, class, I have encircled two grana. On the right-hand side class, that shows you the very same. However, that is a microscopic picture of those. So from here, class, we're moving on. So the thylakoids, I mentioned, contain several other kinds of pigments. Well, it's because those other pigments are needed to also absorb light. For instance, the other pigments are absorbing light. To ensure, class, we can absorb light, well, to ensure that those plants can absorb light, class, in more than just one or two ranges of that visible light spectrum. By having these other pigments, these accessory pigments, they can, of course, use more visible light. And by using more visible light, we're using a, a greater portion of the visible light spectrum as opposed to just this section and that section. And if you're wondering what's this and that, 
Well, what I'm stating is, is other than red and blue. So I'll say one more time. Chlorophyll, the main pigment involved in photosynthesis, absorbs visible light in the red and blue regions, in the blue and red regions. Keep that in mind because I just mentioned to you all that the reason for having those accessory pigments is to ensure that the process class remains efficient, allowing these plants to, of course, absorb wavelengths of light that are not just red and blue, to, of course, use more of this visible light spectrum. Keep also in mind, class, that I said moments ago that these leaves are green, that the plants appear to be green, because green light, class, is not absorbed, but, of course, it is reflected. And that, class, is why they appear to be green, they being the plants. So looking, class, here at chlorophyll, the structure of such, what we see here is... I guess I'll get a bit more specific as far as its rings. So I'm here class on page 190, and this is figure 9-5. Figure 9-5. So those different pigments class I mentioned absorb different wavelengths of light. However, that main pigment class known as chlorophyll, of course, is absorbed in that red and the blue reflecting green light. So green light is not appreciably absorbed by chlorophyll. So I just mentioned, that is why plants class appear to be green, or at least that's the typical color of plants. So the chlorophyll molecule, which we are looking at now, it has two main parts. So it has a complex ring and a long side chain. So you see that complex ring class shown for you here at the top, and you see the side chain class formed of those hydrocarbons shown there here at the bottom. So the ring structure, called the porphyrin ring, is made up of joined similar, excuse me, joined smaller rings that are composed of both carbon and nitrogen atoms. So the porphyrin ring absorbs light energy. So that is, I say, what makes plants what plants are. So the porphyrin ring of chlorophyll is strikingly similar to the heme portion, or that heme group of the red pigment hemoglobin in red blood cells. So you can make that connection, I do hope. However, unlike the heme, which contains an atom of iron in the center of the ring, chlorophyll contains an atom of magnesium in that position. Chlorophyll contains magnesium in that position class, and this is important to know. So with that, the chlorophyll molecule also contains that the long hydrocarbon side chain that makes the molecule extremely nonpolar and anchors the chlorophyll in the membrane. So all chlorophyll molecules in the thylakoid membranes are associated with specific chlorophyll binding proteins. And with those, there are about 15 different kinds. But each thylakoid membrane is filled with a precise oriented chlorophyll molecule, or at least precisely oriented chlorophyll molecules, to be plural, excuse me, you all and chlorophyll binding proteins that help to facilitate the transfer of energy from one molecule to another. So though there are several kinds of chlorophyll, the most important type of chlorophyll class is chlorophyll A. And I'll write it as class being CHL, chlorophyll A. That, that is, that's the main pigment that's involved. So it is what class initiates, I repeat, chlorophyll A is what initiates the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. I say again, chlorophyll A is what initiates those light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis. So that does mean, as I get to this, that there are reactions class in photosynthesis that are dependent upon light and, of course, other reactions that are not necessarily dependent upon reactions. Not necessarily dependent upon light, excuse me. So, as I state that, chlorophyll A, let me grab and change this color. I'll put here light dependent RXNS. Chlorophyll A is their class initiating the light dependent reactions. Well, the other of two is chlorophyll B. So, I'll write chlorophyll B down here. 
and writing it down here just because I have more space down here at the bottom left class. So with chlorophyll B, as I mentioned class, it is an accessory pigment, participating class in photosynthesis, and yes, it does class funnel energy, of course, into funnel energy class 2 chlorophyll A as an accessory pigment. So it does differ a bit, class, from chlorophyll A, only in, of course, functional group in that porphyrin ring. So what I'm getting at here, class, is that difference, and I'm going to get a different color here. I guess I'll go with the red piece. So here, class, I'm mentioning that there is a methyl group. I repeat, there is a methyl group. If you look closely, chlorophyll A has this CH3. Chlorophyll A has that CH3. That's the methyl group. However, in chlorophyll B, they don't have that methyl group. It's actually been replaced. And in chlorophyll B, it's a terminal carbonyl group. So chlorophyll A has the methyl group, whereas chlorophyll B class has that carbonyl group. So there you have it. Differences in the two class structurally. So the difference that's here structurally class also changes them a bit in function. And that change in function class, meaning it shifts the wavelengths of light that are, that are absorbed and reflected class by chlorophyll B. So chlorophyll B class actually will look to be a sort of yellow green color. Chlorophyll B will now appear to be that yellow-green color as opposed to that chlorophyll A class being that light green color. So having done this class, I'll now get farther into other accessory pigments class and the other accessory pigments, I'll refer to those as being the carotenoids. So the carotenoids here, again, are accessory pigments, the, the yellow and the orange. So the carotenoids, they absorb different light waves. I told you, class, these other pigments are here to ensure that photosynthesis is efficient, meaning able to use, I guess I'll say, a broader spectrum of this visible light spectrum. So here, they expand that spectrum of the light that provides energy for photosynthesis. So what that means is that chlorophyll may be excited by light directly, directly by energy pass from it to the light source. So it could also be indirectly by energy passed to it from accessory pigments that have become excited by light. So these are those pigments you see class, I'll say, in fall. As leaves change color, going from that, I guess you say, that green color that's typical to the orange color, or even class that red color, that is exactly class what you're seeing. So when the carotenoid molecule is excited, its energy can be transferred class to chlorophyll A. So I cannot stress enough class is that, that the accessory pigments I'm mentioning here are here class primarily to funnel energy class to chlorophyll A. And they must be there. So now we have both class the absorption and action spectrum of photosynthesis. The absorption spectrum class, I say, is amazing to see and know. I say you should make sure this makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, you should let me know so I can assist you with it. So if you look closely, class, you can see that the estimated absorption here by percentage class is an approximate, I guess I'll say it about a 63 to 64% right there, class, for what is known as chlorophyll A. And then even more so class at about the, I guess about an 83%, excuse me, for chlorophyll B. And then of course, yet again, we see both chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A respectively class being right here at an approximate 43 nano, well, percentage and then an approximate 21%. So what you're seeing here is nothing is occurring. I and, I and I have to say this. 
you're seeing class that nothing is occurring at that wavelength of light. And even so, class, you would say even here, nothing is occurring. So I'm saying all of this to ensure that you see that this is where light is being absorbed, class, by both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Now, to contrast this, you can also look at the action spectrum class on the right. So to look at that action spectrum, I would hope that it's strikingly obvious class that you could say that the relative rate of photosynthesis class here, as well as there, is quite high. And it's all based on, of course, the absorbance of light based on all the visible light spectrum and, of course, those pigments, especially class, the pigment chlorophyll. From here, we're moving right along. And I just can't stress enough, class, that the way in which we got to this was, of course, by experimentation. So the scientific method class is back again. So in, the, in this classic biology experiment, what happened is that Engelman obtained the first action spectrum, and it was back in 1882. How long ago that was, 1882. So as I'm getting to this, what happened is, is the first action spectrum from 1882 was by the experiment that took advantage of the shape of the chloroplast in a species of filamentous algae. Yes, I did say it, filamentous algae. So what Engelman exposed was that in these cells, each of which contained a long chloroplast that filled most of the cell, and he exposed those to a color spectrum produced by passing a light through a prism. And I'm, not, I'm sure you've heard of a prism. It just shines a light, and of course, you get the different lights from that prism. So with that, he hypothesized that if chlorophyll were indeed responsible for photosynthesis, the process would take place most rapidly in the areas where the chloroplast was illuminated by the colors most strongly absorbed by chlorophyll. So, of course, you might wonder how could photosynthesis be measured? And, of course, a day that was so technologically, technologically unsophisticated. Well, what Engelman knew, class, was that photosynthesis produces oxygen and that certain motile bacteria are attracted to these areas of oxygen concentration. So what happened was, I did say that, he determined that the action spectrum of photosynthesis by observing that bacteria swim toward the parts of the filamentous algae in the blue and red regions of the spectrum. So if you would like to know how did he know that they were not simply attracted to the blue or red light, well, England exposed bacteria to the visible light spectrum itself and the absence of algal cells as a control. So there you have it. He had another class, a controlled experiment. So the bacteria showed no preference for any particular wavelength of light. And because the action spectrum of photosynthesis closely matches the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll, it was included by Engelman class at chlorophyll in the chloroplasts and not another compound in another organelle is responsible for photosynthesis. And there have been numerous class sophisticated studies using instruments class, well at least numerous studies using sophisticated instruments that have since confirmed Engelman's conclusions. So as I say this, it's not just by chance class. So we've got to this point to state that hi, it is chlorophyll that is involved. And you can see this experiment class that I just reviewed in your textbook on page 192, and it's the key experiment. So finally, we've made a class to the process, photosynthesis itself. This begins again on page 9, 192, and this is section 9.3. It begins here, class, with the process. These are the reactants class, not just reactants, but also products to the process. For the test class, know this like the back of your hand. I repeat, for your test, you should know this process like the back of your hand. And in fact, I will write it again for your class. So it's, of course, you have to have, you, there must be class 6CO2 plus 6H2O. And depending upon who's teaching your class, it may say plus light energy or plus light there. 
and that yields glass C six H twelve O six plus six O two in class. That's photosynthesis. And of course, you may, depending upon who's teaching the class, you may actually add the thing called light. You might add the class light energy. But of course, that is it. I hope this makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, class, please tell me. Meaning, at this point in the course, you should know everything I have written here, class, in blue and red. So it happens, class, by way of those redox reactions. And you're saying, you say that again, Huff. Yes, I am. So what happens is, is that CO2 class is reduced. And keep in mind, class, reduction does not mean that anything class is lost. It's in fact, class, that CO2 is gaining. And of course, it's actually this H2O class that is oxidized, or that is losing in this case. So to, to make sure I go with this, with this overview class of the process, it is photosynthesis that, of course, allows light energy, meaning that takes light energy that is captured by chlorophyll to power the synthesis of carbohydrates. So what you're seeing here in this depiction class, and I guess I'll go to one more color, is that bingo, that class is the carbohydrate there. So this process class occurs in two phases, the light-dependent reactions, and of course it says here the photo part of photosynthesis, and the carbon fixation reactions, or carbon fixation, called that synthesis part of photosynthesis. So if you can get those two parts there, class, you're good as go with me. As opposed to over the respiration class with four steps, photosynthesis class only has these two, the light-dependent reactions and the light-independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle, or even you could call it class, the carbon fixation reactions. So if you look closely, what we have here, class, are the light-dependent reactions occurring here, class, by way of the talicoids. And I did say the talicoids. So that's here. And then on the right-hand side, class, we have the carbon fixation reactions. And by way of these carbon fixation reactions, as it states, this occurs, class, in the stroma. And if you can think back with me, this was mentioned to you all not long ago by stating it high in the stroma. There is a watery substance class that's there for the synthesis class of carbohydrates. So to help you with what's being shown to you class and to make it, a, I guess as I say, a bit plain. So yes, we have those light reactions that must occur. Upon the light reactions occurring class, I hope you can see that, of course, water is required. But there's a byproduct given off class is oxygen that's called gas. So that oxygen class will leave the leaf by way of the stomata. Of course, from such, what is created, I'm giving you the overview class, what is created are, are two pieces. One class is ATP, and two class is NADPH. Yes, I said NADPH. Those two classes are like batteries, such as the battery in your phone, the battery class in your pocket. Well, I don't know if you have a battery in your pocket, but the battery in your, your car, your van, your SUV, your, your truck, your, your crossover, your minivan, I guess your maxi van, whatever that means. But what I'm stating is this. It's those two, ATP and NADPH, that power class, the Calvin cycle, which of course will take in the CO2, meaning the leaf takes in carbon dioxide, meaning for carbon fixation, I just mentioned, by way of those stomata class, this gas diffuses into the leaf. And of course, in the end class, what's produced are known as carbohydrates. This is class and overview of the process. Let's start the process off. So here we are, class, with the light-dependent reaction. So to help you out with what's happening here, class, the light-dependent reaction is here to convert sunlight into chemical energy. So converting that light energy, class, into the chemical form of energy. And I just gave you this class moments ago. To help you out, what happens to your class is called non-cyclic electron flow. So non-cyclic electron flow is here class to, I guess I'll call it to synthesize. It's here class to synthesize those two forms of chemical energy class I just mentioned. They are ATP and NADPH. Bingo. So what happens class is the sunlight. Sunlight hits the water in the stroma. 
when the sunlight hits the water in the stroma, what then happens, class, is water is split. As soon as that happens, class, oxygen is released. So as a byproduct, class, oxygen is released. And this, of course, is molecular oxygen, VO. So the water in the stroma, class, is also going to be found in photosystems 2 and 1. So the water in the stroma will also be found in photosystems 2 and 1. I'll abbreviate that class by writing PS. Photosystems 2 and 1. And yes, I did put 2 before 1 class for a reason. So with that, we have now class 2 hydrogen ions and 2 electrons. Keep those in mind because we split the water. We have, of course, our 2 hydrogen ions and our 2 electrons. Let's keep hitting it. So the energy of energized electrons is used to phosphorylate, here we go, adenosine diphosphate into adenosine triphosphate. So there you have the ATP class of mentioned we were going to make. And along with such, what I'll say class is that the coenzyme NADP becomes reduced class forming NADPH. So of course, as it states, it is ATP and NADPH that are used in the energy requiring carbon fixation reactions. I can't stress enough. I say that again, that is the reason the light dependent reactions class are around to make these forms of energy. So as far as carbon fixation is concerned, what happens with carbon fixation is that it fixes those carbon atoms class from CO2 and they're fixed, of course, or it is fixed, and it is fixed class into, of course, the carbohydrates class needed. That takes place class in the stroma. So now that you've had this overview class, let's get a bit more specific to, to what's happening here. So we take light energy class from the sunlight. It phosphorylates class ADP into ATP, reducing class, meaning, I told you reduce means to gain, reducing class NADPH to form class it, it reduces class NADP plus, excuse me, to NADPH. And on the test class, I'm going to be very blunt here. I will not ask you to write out the number of these. However, you should know what is occurring class in, in, the, in these steps. So shown before you now class is what a photosystem looks like. So I'll begin here class by describing photosystem 2. So by way of photosystem 2, well, we have a magnesium atom, and that magnesium atom is what's going to lose those two electrons. I say again, the magnesium atom will lose two, that's the number two, will lose two electrons. And it's due to all of the energy being funneled into the chlorophyll from chlorophyll B, as well as the carotenoids. And the same thing, class, will be happening in, of course, photosystem 1. In photosystem 1, the magnesium will also lose two electrons. So it states, two types of photosynthetic units are involved in photosynthesis. They are as follows. Photosystem 2, shown here, and photosystem 1, class, shown there. So in photosystem 2, or called P680, it consists of those two chlorophyll A molecules with an absorption peak of 680 nanometers with the absorption peak of 680 nanometers. And then, of course, we have photosystem 1, with that, of course, the two chlorophyll A molecules with the absorption peak class of 700 nanometers. So with this, a pigment molecule in an antenna complex absorbs a photon of light. So the energy is transferred from one pigment to another until it reaches the reaction center. So where it then will excite an electron class from the P700 to a higher energy level. So with this, the energized electron is passed along the electron transport chain to ferrodoxin. There we go. Then, of course, transfers the electron to, of course, 
that NADP plus in the presence of ferrodoxin class with NADP plus reductase. So as all of this happens, class, what then will occur ultimately is the energy will be transferred to excite NP680 to a higher level, and the electron is accepted by a primary electron acceptor, pheophyton. And then it will pass on to electron transport chain until it's only a class to P70 in photosystem 1. I'm not going through this class to confuse you. However, what I am saying is, is we go from photosystem 2, the electron will, and as it does move by way of the electron transport chain, in the presence of light, there is a continuous one-way flow of electrons from water to NADP+. So the electrons in photosystem 2 will, of course, go through photolysis of water, releasing oxygen. So those electrons are transferred class along the electron transport chain from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, which classes will output 2 before 1 here earlier. So the energy of a proton gradient is generated by the electron transport chain, and it then class is used to produce ATP by way of chemi osmosis. So, the electrons in photosystem 1, however, they will then class be replaced and donated to photosystem 2. So, of course, that's why NADP plus is then class reduced to NADPH, which is released into the stroma. And I didn't mean to take so much time to get here, class. However, I do want you all to know what's happening so you do understand the process. So if I need to say it a different way, make sure that you remember, class, that from photosystem one, by way of non-cyclic electron flow, we create, or at least those plants create, that NADP H. So what I'll get to lastly is it's only in photosystem one that is involved in the cyclic electron flow. So those energized electrons will go from P700 and end at P700 because I say again, it's cyclic electron flow. So for cyclic electron flow, of course, what happens is the electrons is continue class to the cycle and the energy of the proton gradient is used to produce class, what is known as ATP, by way of chemiosmosis. If you think back with me, class, that uses two processes, meaning it uses both facilitated diffusion as well as active transport active transport, excuse me, to phosphorylate adenosine diphosphate to adenosine tri triphosphate. So keep in mind that no NADPH is produced here because there is no, of course, water is not here and oxygen is not generated. So keep in mind, it is by way of non-cyclic electron flow. It is by non-cyclic electron flow class that NADPH class is synthesized, as opposed to, of course, the way in which by way of cyclic electron flow is that way that ATP class is produced. So it, and it doesn't necessarily class support photosynthesis, but of course it must occur to have the energy to power the light in the process. So if you look at this chart, this chart class is good to, of course, give you an overview of what I just did. So for none, cyclic electron flow class the electrons there are coming from water, as opposed to with cyclic electron flow, it's non-electrons. They cycle class of the system. Oxygen is released from non-cyclic electron flow, and it is not released class from cyclic electron flow. So what I'll get to is, is the term electron acceptor class is NADP with non-cyclic electron flow. And of course, the form of energy class that is, of course, created is ATP by psychic electron flow. And there's both ATP and NADPH by non psychic electron flow. However, class, the major reason it's there is to, of course, synthesize NADPH. So, what happens, class, is that energy from those electrons passing through the electron transport chain, they pump protons. They pump them, class, from the stroma into the thylakoid membrane. The protons will diffuse from the thylakoid lumen into the stroma through channels class formed by ATP synthase. I told you class, this is chemiosmosis. This is the coupling of, of course, passive and active transport 
energy coupling to synthesize energy in the form of ATP. What states are that ATP synthase catalyzes glass, the phosphorylation, or at least the photophosphorylation glass of ADP into ATP. So there you have it, glass. We now have what we need to end the process. And I'm saying it is because what happens is it's because of those the trapped hydrogen ions. So those trapped hydrogen ions were found in the thylakoid. And as I just mentioned, they'll be released through the ATP synthase complex to, of course, help make ATP by anabolic or photophosphorylation. So ADP turns into ATP, along with the kinetic movement of those hydrogen ions to produce those large amounts of ATP. So it's all here, class, and it's by, by way of chemiosmosis. So I won't say you should have to know anything about these numbers here, class. But of course, it's this energy, the chemical energy we made, class, ATP and NADPH, that is used to form the organic molecules from CO2. So, of course, that's just stating that you're using, class, ATP and NADPH for carbon fixation. So, having gotten to this, let's end the process. Go to the calorie cycle. So, the light independent reactions. What happens here, class, is there's also another way, also known as the C3 pathway, so that in which the initial carbon fixation is a three carbon molecule. So, let's go to those three phases, and we'll be done with this class pretty soon because it'll be the uptake of CO2. After that, we'll get to reducing carbon. And, of course, we'll get to the rubulose bisphosphate generation, or RUBP generation. Let's begin. So CO2 will react class with rubulose bisphosphate, or RUBP. It's catalyzed by, of course, I'll just call it rubisco, not nubisco, to make cookies and crackers. But this is catalyzed by rubisco. So this unstable six carbon product will break down into two, three carbon molecules. And we'll call those two G3Ps. So what will then happen is that the carbon of the CO2 has been fixed to a carbon skeleton. I like skeletons. And I say that because we're using now class, the energy, ATP and NADPH to, of course, take what was once that three carbon phosphoglycerate, the PGA, and of course to form those two G3 Ps. So this is at an external reaction class, and the, those two G3 Ps will lead to the formation class of either A, glucose, or B, fructose. And we're pretty much class done with the process. So with this, one of those G3Ps class will be taken out to synthesize the glucose, to synthesize the fructose. And the other will stay in the cycle. So, of course, it can have yet another turn. So, of course, we're back here at the beginning. The rubulose bisphosphate is phosphorylated class by ATP to produce the, of course, other rubulose bisphosphate, which is used to restart the cycle. So, as you see it here, class, I hope this makes it a bit clearer. First things first, class, you must have CO2. You cannot have carbon fixation class without a source of carbon. Carbon enters class. We have the six molecules class of rubulose bisphosphate. So by way of those, we also class use rubisco. So by way of those and the enzyme class, we can then take what is left over being the PGA and convert those class into two G3Ps. So one G3P class will leave the cycle. One G3P class will stay in the cycle. And after two turns of the Calvin cycle class, we get, of course, glucose and other carbohydrate synthesis. And it's all based on energy class created by way of the process known as the light of interactions by way of ATP and NADPH to power it. So, one thing I will mention, class, is that photorespiration does not produce ATP. 
So on those hot, dry days, a C3 plant class, such as soybean, wheat, they close the modic class to conserve water. It's, it's hot. So photosynthesis will rapidly use up that CO2 in the leaf, and the oxygen class accumulates in the chloroplast. So oxygen will then bind to rubisco, and then, of course, it will use oxygenase and degrade certain, of course, CO2 and H2O, meaning certain molecules to those that they do need to, of course, get back to, of course, the products of photosynthesis. It's a, di a bit different class in C4 plants and in CAM plants. So the plants that are C4s and CAM class live in those dry, hot environments. So they have adaptations to facilitate their carbon fixation. For instance, a C4 plant must first fix CO2 into a 4-carbon oxoacetate. That 4-carbon oxoacetate. So the CAM plants, they, however, fix carbon at night. Yeah, I said they fix carbon class at night. And that, of course, that's to the formation class of the same thing, oxoacetate. So these, of course, precede the Calvin cycle. And, of course, that's C3, but they do not class replace it. The Calvin cycle yet remains. It's just a bit, of course, different in the way they get there. So with C4 plants, the process begins with the mesophyll cells. However, of course, that C3 cycle takes place in the bundle sheaths. And you think about bundle sheaths class, if you're thinking about, of course, those plants are like the grass, such as the grasses themselves. So with that, what I'll get to is that the oxoacetate will be converted class to malate, and then, of course, decarboxylated to what you need class being pyruvate and CO2. And I hope this makes a bit of sense mentioning pyruvate class and, of course, with carbon dioxide. Because with that, so you have, of course, the malate here, you have the pyruvate there, and from each of those, the glucose can then be, the CO2, excuse me, can be used to, of course, be fixed into glucose, the C4 pathway. And lastly, in the CAM plants class, in those dry, arid places, they, of course, include the cactuses, the lilies, and orchids. Well, of course, as this happens, they use crassulation acid. I repeat, they use crassulation acid in that CAM pathway. So it's called crassulation acid metabolism, or CAM photosynthesis. So their somatic class will open at night, and as they open at night, of course, CO2 then enters. So as CO2 enters, they use pepcarboxylase class. It is called pepcarboxylase to fix CO2. And they, of course, then, again, class form oxoacetate, which is going to convert it to malate and store it in the vacuoles. So during the day, CO2 is removed by malate. During the day, CO2 is removed by malate by the way of de decarboxylation. And then, of course, used again in the C3 cycle. So I did all of that class because, hey, the chapter is on photosynthesis. And how can I teach photosynthesis without having, of course, CAM photosynthesis? without having C4 and CAM. So I say it this way and go back just a bit to ensure that you understand that the C4 and C3 plants, they occur, of course, the pathway in different locations within the leaf of that C4 plant. For instance, a C4 plant class, as it states here, will initially fix CO2 in the mesophyll cells. However, the CAM and C3 pathways occur at different times within that same cell of the CAM plant, i.e., the CAM plant class takes the CO2 at night. So if you can get these small differences class, there is nothing I can ask on the test that you will not understand well. So just keep in mind, class, that a photoautotroph uses light energy to make ATP and NADPH. A chemoheterotroph obtains energy from chemicals by redox reactions, meaning the reduction and oxidation. So with this, those organic molecules are produced by other organisms to synthesize the carbon molecules they need. So the photoheterotrophs, they use light energy, but do not carry out carbon fixation. They obtain the carbon class from organic compounds. Lastly, class here, Chemoautotrophs, they obtain the energy from oxidation class of reduced inorganic molecules such as hydrogen sulfide, 
nitrate, or ammonia. And of course, they capture the energy to carry out carbon fixation. So there are a few mechanisms, class, that regulate the relative activities of photosynthesis and aerobic respiration in plants. So the light reactions, they cause those stoma to become more basic and activate those enzymes of the Calvin cycle. So with that, the light inhibits enzymes of glycolysis in the cytosol, and bright light glass promotes photorespiration. photorespiration. So what I'm stating is it's a number of mechanisms, class, that plants have to ensure that these processes are regulated. And by regulating these processes, it's the environment class that, of course, are in control of when this occurs, such as, I guess you say, the Calvin cycle by way of photosynthesis, or when that occurs, such as, of course, the photorespiration. For instance, it might be that starch will be stored in starch granules that form inside the chloroplast. And it may very well also be that the disaccharide maltose is transported out of the chloroplast and then, of course, cleaved in the cytosol to provide glucose for aerobic respiration. So if you ask, why do plants go through these processes? Well, the reason they do is because, just as we do, we also, class, need a source of carbon. And not just, class, for a source of carbon, but, of course, to ensure we can synthesize ATP, both respiration, in the mitochondria. So, G3P, if you've ever wondered, because I mentioned it earlier, and I kind of said it a little, a little too earlier, I think, a little too early, I think, in the lecture, but this class is that basis for a state's chemical synthesis. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, what I mean, class, is G3P is here to convert class glucose into starch. It is here, class, to be converted to amino acids. Yes, G3P can be converted class into amino acids. It can also, class, be converted to fatty acids. So from glucose to starch is one way. N2 class and amino acid is another way. N2 class fatty acids another way. And even class into other organic molecules needed by the plant itself. So it's an amazing molecule class in that it can be converted into other molecules. And I mentioned lastly it can be converted class into the disaccharide sucrose and then use class to synthesize various other organic molecules. So this has been your lecture class on photosynthesis, and this does end test content for your second test on chapters 7, 8, and 9. For your test class, please be prepared to describe the process. What process? The process of photosynthesis. Of course, it is a bit more concise class than, of course, you found with respiration in that this process only has a two-piece. There are class the light-dependent reaction, as well as class, the Calvin cycle, the light independent reaction, or even class, I guess you'd call it carbon fixation. So this has been your instructor, Skylar Huff. And if there are any questions about this lecture, please let me know. But try to take your notes early and often, and then, of course, make them into something that's much more concise, that you understand well. Thank you all for listening, and have a great day.